Hey everyone. Um, so we're going to read, I think we're going to try reading two chapters today. Um, we're still on Island of the Blue Dolphins. Um, and yeah, so let's go. Uh, chapter 19. Another summer had come and still I had not speared the giant devilfish that lived near the cave. Every day during the spring, Rontu and I went to look for him. I would put the canoe in the water and paddle slowly through the cave, from one opening to the other, often several times. I saw many devil fish. There were the black <clears throat> I saw many devil fish there where the black water is streaked with light, but not the giant one. At last I gave up looking for him and began to gather abalones for winter. The red shells hold the sweetest meat and are best for drying, though the green ones and the black ones are also good. Because the red ones are the sweetest, starfish prey upon them. The star-shaped creature places itself over the shell of an abalone, with its five arms spread out against the rock to which the abalone is fastened. It holds the shell with its suckers, and then it begins to lift itself. The starfish pulls against the abalone shell, sometimes for days, holding on with its suckers and pulling up with its legs until little by little, the heavy shell comes loose from the body. One morning we left the cave and paddled out to the reef, which it, <clears throat> which is joined to it. For many days I had been gathering a few shellfish on the rocks at Coral Cove, but I had been watching the reef and waiting for the right time to harvest. This is when there are few starfish feeding, for they are as hard to pry loose from an abalone as an abalone is to pry from a rock. The tide was low, and the reef rose far out of the water. Along its sides were a great number of red abalones and very few starfish, so before the sun was high, I filled the bottom of the canoe. The day was windless, and since I had all I could carry, I tied the canoe with Rontu following me. Um... Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> the day was windless, and since I had all I could carry, I tied the canoe, and with Ranchu following me, climbed onto the reef to look for fish to spear for our supper. Blue dolphins were leaping beyond the kelp beds, and the kelp otter were playing at the games they never tired of, and around me everywhere the gulls were fishing for scallops, which were numerous that summer. They grew on the floating kelp leaves, and there were so many of them that the kelp near the reef had been dragged to the bottom. Still, there were scallops that the gulls could reach, and taking them in their beaks, they would fly far above the reef and let them drop. The gulls would then swoop down to the rocks and pick the meat from the broken shells. Scallop fell on the reef like rain, which amused me, but not Rondu, who did not understand what the gulls were doing. Dodging this way and that, I went to the end of the reef where the biggest fish live. With a sinew line and a hook made of abalone shell, I caught two that had large heads and long teeth, but are good to eat. I gave one to Rontu, and on the way back to the canoe, gathered purple sea urchins to use for dyeing. Rontu, who was trotting along in front of me, suddenly dropped his fish and stood looking down over the edge of the reef. There, swimming in the clear water, was a devilfish. It was the same one I had been hunting for. It was the giant. Seldom do you see any devilfish here, for they like deep places, and the water along this part of the reef is shallow. Perhaps this one lived in the cave, and came here only when he could not find food. Rontu made no sound. I fixed the head of the spear and the long string that held to my wrist. I then crawled back to the edge of the reef. The giant had not moved. He was floating just beyond the surface of the water, and I could plainly see his eyes. They were the size of small stones and stood out from his head, with black rims and gold centers, and in the centers a black spot, like the eyes of a spirit I had once seen on a night that rain fell and lightning forked in the sky. Where my hands rested was a deep crevice, and in it a fish was hiding. The giant was half the length of my spear from the reef, but while I was watching, one of his long arms ran out like a snake and felt its way into the crevice. It went past the fish and along the side of the rock, and then the end of it curled back. As the arm gently wound itself around the fish from behind, I rose to one knee and drove the spear. I aimed at the giant's head, 
but though it was larger than my two fishes and a good target, I missed. The spear struck down through the water and slanted off. Instantly, a black cloud surrounded the devilfish. The only thing I could see of him was one long arm still grasping his prey. I jumped to my feet to pull in the spear, thinking that I might have a chance to throw it again. As I did so, the shaft bobbed back to the surface, and I saw that the barbed point had come loose. At the same moment, the string tightened. My grip on, <clears throat> on it broke, and aware that I had struck the devilfish, I quickly dropped the coils I held, for when the string runs out fast, it burns your hands or becomes entangled. The devilfish does not swim with flippers or fins, like other things in the sea. He takes water in through the hole in the front of his body and pushes the water out behind through two slits. When he is swimming slowly, you can see these two streams trailing out, but only then. When he moves fast, you see nothing except a streak in the water. The coils I had dropped on the rock hopped and sang as they ran. Then there was no more of them. The string tightened on my wrist, and, to lessen the shock, I leaped across the crevice in the direction the giant had taken. With the string in both hands, but still fastened to my wrist, I braced my feet on the slippery rock and leaned backwards. The string snapped tight with the weight of the devilfish. It began to stretch. I feared that it might break. I walked forward, yet I made him pull me every step. He was moving towards the cave, along the edge of the reef. The cave was a good distance away. If he got there, I would surely lose him. The canoe was tied just in front of me. Once I was in it, I could let him pull me until he grew tired. But there was no way to untie the canoe and still hold on to the string. Rontu all this time was running up and down the reef barking and leaping at me which made my task harder step by step I walked forward until the devil fish was in the deep water close to the cave he was so close that I had to stop even if the sinew broke and I lost him I therefore braced myself and did not move the sinew stretched throwing off droplets of water I could hear it stretch and I was sure it would break I did not feel it cutting into my hands, though they bled. The pull suddenly lessened, and I was sure that he was gone, but the next instant I saw the string cutting the water in a wide circle. He was swimming off from the cave, and the reef towards some rocks that were about twice the length of the string away. He would be safe there too, for among them there were many places to hide. I pulled in half the string while he was moving towards the rocks, but soon had to let it out again. It grew tight, and again began to stretch. The water here was only a little over my waist, and I let myself down over the reef. There was a sandbar not far from the rocks, and stepping carefully on the bottom, which was full of holes, I slowly made my way towards it. Rontu swam along by my side. I reached the sandbar before the devilfish could hide himself in the rocks. The string held, and he turned about and once more swam towards the cave. Twice again he did this, each time I took in some of the string. The third time, as he came up into the shallow water, I walked backwards across the sandbar so he would not see me and pulled on the string with all my strength. The giant slid up on the sand. He lay with his arms spread out, partly in the water, and I thought he was dead. Then I saw his eyes moving. Before I could shout a warning, Rontu had rushed and seized him, but the devil wish, devilfish was too heavy to lift or shake. As Rontu's jaws sought another hold, three of the many arms round themselves around his neck. Devilfish are only dangerous in the water where they can fasten themselves to you with their long arms. These long arms have rows of suckers underneath them, and they can drag you under and hold you there until you drown. But even on the land, the devilfish can injure you, for he is strong and does not die quickly. The giant was flailing his arms, struggling to get back into the water. Little by little, he was dragging Ronchu with him. I could no longer use the string because it was round, wound around Ronchu's legs. The whalebone knife I used for prying abalones from the rocks was tied to a thong on my waist. The blade was thick at the point, but it had a sharp edge. I dropped the coils of string and unfashioned the knife as I ran. I ran past the devilfish and got between him and the deep water. So many of his arms were flailing that it was useless to cut any one of them. One struck me on the leg and burned like a whip. Another, which Rontu had chewed off, lay wriggling at the edge of the water as if it were looking for something to fasten onto. The head rose out of the twisting arms like a giant stalk. The gold eyes with their black rims were fixed on me.
Above the sounds of the waves and the water splashing and Ronchu's barking, I could hear the snapping of his beak, which was sharper than the knife I held in my hand. I drove the knife down into his body, and as I did this, I was suddenly covered, or so it seemed, with a countless number of leeches sucking at my skin. Fortunately, one hand was free, and the knife that and the hand that held the knife. And again and again, I struck down through the tough hide. The suckers, which were fastened to me and pained greatly, lessened their hold. Slowly, the arms stopped moving and then grew limp. I tried to drag the devil fish out of the water, but my strength was gone. I did not even go back to the reef for my canoe, though I did take the shaft and the head of the spear, which had cost me much labor, and the sinew line. It was night before Rontu and I got back to the house. Rontu had a gash on his nose from the giant's beak, and I had many cuts and bruises. I saw two more giant devilfish along the reef that summer, but I did not try to spear them. Chapter 20 I gathered two more canoe loads of abalone soon after that, mostly the sweet red ones, which I had cleaned and carried to the house. Along the south part of the fence where the sun shone most of the day, I built long shelves out of branches and put the meat up to dry. Abalones are larger than your hand and twice as thick when fresh, but they shrink small in the sun, so you have to dry many. In the old days on the island, there were children to keep away the gulls, which would rather feast on abalones than anything else. In one morning, if the meat was left unguarded, they would fly off with a month's harvest. At first, whenever I went to the spring or to the beach, I left Rontu behind to chase them off, but he did not like this and howled all the time I was gone. Finally, I tied strings to some of the abalone shells and hung them from the poles. The insides of the shells were bright and catch the sun, and they turned one way and another in the wind. After that, I had little trouble with the gulls. I also caught small fish in a net I had made and hung them up to dry for winter light. With meat drying on the shelves and the shells flashing and turning in the wind and the strings of fish hanging on the fence, the yard looked as if the whole village were living there on the headland instead of just Rontu and me. Every morning after I had gathered food for the winter, we went out on the sea. At the end of the summer, I would gather roots and seeds to store, but now there was nothing that needed to be done. We went many places those first days of summer, to the beach where the elephant seals lived, to Black Cave, which was even larger than the first cave we found, and to Tall Rock where the cormorants roosted. Tall Rock was more than a league from the island and was black and shimmering because it was covered with cormorants. I killed 10 of the birds the first time we went there and I skinned and fleshed them and put them out to dry for someday I wanted to make myself a skin of cormor a skirt of cormorant feathers. <clears throat> Black Cave was on the south coast of the island near the place where the canoes were stored. In front of the cave was a high ledge of rocks surrounded by deep kelp beds and I would have paddled by it if I had not seen a seahawk fly out. The sun was in the west, and I had a long way to go to reach home, but I was curious about the hawk and the place he lived in. The opening of the cave was small, like the one in the cave under the headland, and Rontu and I had to crouch low to get through. Weak light came from outside, and I saw that we were in a room with black shining walls that curved high overhead. At the far end of the room was another small opening. It was long and very dark, but when we reached the end of it, there was another room which was larger than the first and lit with a shaft of light. The light came from the sun, which shone down through a, dragged, a jagged crack in the ceiling. Seeing the sun shining down and the black shadows drifting over the walls, Rontu barked and then began to howl. The sound echoed through the cave like the howling of a whole pack of dogs. It sent a cold feeling down my back. Be quiet, I shouted, putting my hand over his jaws. My words echoed and echoed in the room. I turned the canoe around and started back towards the opening. Above it, on a deep ledge that ran from one side of the room to the other, my gaze fell upon a row of strange figures. There must have been two dozen of them standing against the black wall. They were as tall as I, with long arms and legs and short bodies made of reeds and clothed in gull feathers. Each one had eyes fashioned of round or oblong disks of abalone shell, but the rest of their faces were blank. Their eyes glittered down at me, moved as the light on the water moved and was reflected upon me. They were more alive than the eyes of those who lived. In the middle of the group was a seated figure, a skeleton. 
It sat leaning against the wall with its knees drawn up, and in its fingers, which were raised to its mouth, a flute of pelican bone. There were other things there on the ledge, in the shadows among the standing figures, but having drifted far back in the room, I again paddled towards the opening. I had forgotten that the tide was coming in. To my great surprise, the opening had narrowed. It was too small for me to get through. We would have to stay here in the room until the tide went out, until dawn came. I paddled to the far end of the cave. I did not look back at the glittering eyes of the figures on the ledge. I crouched in the bottom of the canoe and watched the shaft of light grow weak. The opening out to the sea grew smaller and finally disappeared. Night came and a star showed through the crevice overhead. This star passed out of sight and another took its place. The tide lifted the canoe higher in the room and as the water lapped against the walls, it sounded like the soft music of a flute. It played many tunes through the long night and I slept little watching the stars change. I knew that the skeleton who sat on the ledge playing his flute was one of my ancestors and the others with the glittery eyes, though only images were two, and still I was sleepless and afraid. With the first light, another high tide almost setting, we left the cave. I did not look up at those standing quietly on the ledge or at the flute player playing for them, but paddled fast out into the morning sea, nor did I look back. I suppose this cave once had a name, I said to Ronchu, who was as glad as I was to be free, but I have never heard of it or heard it spoken about. We will call it Black Cave and never in all our days go there again. When we came back from our voyage to Tall Rock, I hid the canoe in the cave below the headland. It was hard work, but each time I would lift the canoe from the water and onto the ledge, even though I planned to go out the next morning. Two summers had come and gone and the alley hunters had not returned, yet during those days I always looked for them. At dawn, as Rontu and I went down the cliff, I would watch the ocean for their sails. The summer air was clear and I could see many leagues. Wherever we went in the canoe, I would never be gone longer than half a day. On the way home, I always paddled close to shore and looked for them. It was the last time that we went to Tall Rock that the Aleuts came. I had hidden the canoe and climbed the cliff with the ten cormorant skins slung over my back. At the top of the cliff I stood for a while gazing at the sea. <coughs> there were some small clouds on the water. One of them, the smallest, did not, did not look like the others and as I watched I saw that it was a ship. The sun made bright scales on the water but I could see clearly. There were two sails and it was a ship coming towards the island. For a long time I could not tell the color of the sails. I wondered if it could be the white men, though now I thought about them little and seldom looked for them. I left the cormorants hanging on the fence and went to the rock on the headland. I could see no better from the rock because the sun was low and the whole ocean was covered with light. Then as I stood there, I remembered that the white men's ship would come from the east. This one had come from a different direction, from the north. I still was not sure that it belonged to the Aleuts but I decided to pack the things that I would need to take to the cave in the ravine. There was much to take. My two birds, the skirt I had made, my stone utensils, my beads and earrings, the cormorant feathers and all my baskets and weapons. The abalones were not yet dry, so I would have to leave them. When I had packed everything and put it beside the hole under the fence, I went back to the headland. I lay on the rock so that I would not be seen and peered over its rim toward the north. For a moment, I did not find the ship, and then I saw that it had traveled faster than I thought it would. It was already rounding the kelp bed, close to the rocks of Coral Cove. The last of the sun shone on the ship, on the bow, which was made like the beak of a bird, and on two red sails. I knew that the Aleuts would not come on shore in the dark, and that I had until morning to carry my things to the cave, but I did not wait. Most of the night I worked, making two trips to the cave. At dawn, when everything had been moved, I went back to the house for the last time. There, I buried the ashes of my fire and threw sand over the shelves on the floor. I took down the shells that I had put up to scare the gulls and tossed them and the abalones over the cliff. At last, with a pelican wing, I brushed away the marks of my feet. When I had finished, it looked as though no one had lived there for a long time. By now, the sun was up and I climbed onto the rock. The ship lay at anchor in the cove. Canoes were bringing goods to the shore, and some were out in the kelp bed, beginning to hunt for otter. There was a fire on the shore, 
and beside it, a girl. She was cooking something, and I could see the fire shining on her hair. I did not stay long on the headlands. Always in the past, I had gone to the ravine by a different way, so as not to wear a trail. This time, I went off towards the west along the cliff and then doubled back through the brush, being careful to leave no tracks. Frontier's prints did not matter because the Aleuts knew there were dogs on the island. The cave was very dark, and I had trouble getting Rontu to go through the small opening. Only after I had crawled in and out several times would he follow me. I closed the opening with stones, and since I was tired, lay down and slept all that day. I slept until I could see the stars shining between the cracks and the rocks. So, this is where we see... Um, the first time that people have come back, um, and it's going to be kind of interesting to see <clears throat> how, how that is for her. Cause like we talked about last time, she was doing okay on her own. I mean, she, um, she even handled the devil fish all by herself. Um, you know, she's grown a lot. We saw at the beginning of the book, um, when everyone lived on the island with her, she wouldn't have been allowed to hunt and no one had taught her how to fish or anything, but she figured all of those things out by herself and she made all kinds of tools and fishing equipment. And um, so it's kind of important to see her um, get the devil fish because it's a very difficult creature to catch. And it requires it required a lot of specialized equipment that she had to make herself that no one had ever taught her really how to make. She just kind of had a general idea of what, you know, she'd kind of seen those things around. She had to figure out how to make them. And um, and again, um, in that same chapter, we see the uh, so the black cave where she's she finds her ancestors. Um, but it's possible that, so she'd never heard of that place before, but in her, in her village before the Aleuts had come and everyone had died, um, it's possible that just was not something that she was allowed to know about. Maybe that was something that only, you know, the leaders of her village knew about, um, or maybe only the men knew about. Um, so she's getting to see parts of her society that she wouldn't normally be able to, but she's also by herself, but she's handling it well. And now something kind of scary happens. The people who, who destroyed her village, who killed everyone that she knew, they're back. And, but she doesn't get scared. She knows just what to do. She gets all her food. She gets all her stuff. She already has a plan. Um, so we see that Karana has really grown um, and she can take care of herself. So we'll see what happens next um, when maybe she actually, you know, does she meet them? She said there's a girl with them. Maybe she meets a girl. Um, but yeah, so um, it was good to read with you guys. Um, we'll keep reading this book. We're not too far from being done. Just got a little bit left. Okay, bye.